Today, Camilla batman Gailage, one of the most charismatic charity leaders in the country, agreed to step aside after ministers intervened in her charity. As Newsnight and BuzzFeed revealed yesterday, the Cabinet Office is holding back £3 million from Kids Company, her charity, until she goes. Quite a sum for an organisation with £20 million of annual spending. And quite a stunning reversal for a darling of the establishment, once a speaker at Tory conference. In fact, the Conservative leadership have been strikingly generous to her until now. Now, one of Miss batman Gurge's key political alliances was forged years ago. She got to know Steve Hilton, later the Prime Minister's guru, when he was just a mere better business consultant. Now, that alliance paid off in 2011, when Downing Street, where Mr Hilton worked, overruled the Department for Education's decision not to give Kids Company a big grant. Mr Hilton and Cabinet Office Minister Oliver Letwin argued that she should get support against the wishes of the Education Ministries Tim Loughton and Michael Gove, who both thought that other charities made a better case for the cash. The charity, it was decided, should get £4 million a year for a few years. But ministers wanted to stop Ms batman Gelich coming back for state cash again. A civil servant was even seconded briefly to help her. A former number 10 insider said it was always this hand-to-mouth thing. The money's running out. You felt blackmailed. She's a visionary leader with great insight, but not necessarily someone to run an organisation. By 2011, there were already serious concerns about the charity. Quite simply, on a Friday, it was allowance day and money was handed out. And it was uh, in the form of, of cash in envelopes, sometimes with travel cards. And young people would turn up and collect and it meant that there were relatively large numbers of young people coming to collect money, not to engage in the interventions offered by the youth centre, but simply to collect their allowance. Uh, they didn't all get on with each other. There were often quite high tension situations, altercations between young people. One major concern has also been the difficulty in establishing just how good Kids Company is. What we know from, from the published information, I would say is relatively tenuous. It's typically small sample sizes over short periods of time and it's based on self-report uh, and not cross-referenced with information on outcomes in health, in uh, criminal justice, um, in education, where information is readily available and could be used. The Kids Company's work is so hard to measure because the ultimate offering is a cherished, nurturing environment. Um, when I first started working the charity in 2006, uh, I remember uh, meeting a, a young lady who was terribly disturbed, um, couldn't sit still, couldn't communicate to anyone. I went back three years later uh, and after she'd received the, the trauma, psychology, and actually had been um, exposed to other children and felt safe and uh, less vulnerable, I had a, um, a conversation that I don't think I'd, I'd have been able to have three years earlier. And that young lady went out into the world and got a job and moved on. And I think something like that just shows you can't value that. There have even been arguments about just how many children attend. So there's a question about effectiveness. There's a question about the number of young people supported by Kids Company. And the reason there's a question is because those numbers look surprising. Uh, the claimed figures, if you just compare them directly, to social services, social services, social workers working with children. If you compare directly, you find that a kids' company key worker has a caseload which is twice as high as a children's services social worker. And that's surprising for a number of reasons, but it's particularly surprising given that most of kids' companies' key workers are not trained social workers. There are, of course, lots of people who believe that the ethos and the theory of Kids Company really does make sense. We spoke to lots of donors today, but even among them, there was a sense that it was time for Ms. batman Gillage to take a back seat. Even among some of her supporters, her staunchest allies, they said she's not really the right person to run a £20 million a year charity. The sad thing is that uh, her, she ended, it's ending or she's moved on in, in this way. Um, I, I know that she always had a succession plan, uh, it clearly didn't get to that stage, but what a lot of people don't realise, as well as being the Chief Executive Officer of this organisation, she was raising personally up to 15 million a year and delivering a lot of the programmes. 
Camilla batman is Kids Company. No one doubts her intentions, nor that she's helped lots of young people and their families. But even with her connections, she pressed the limits of what politicians felt they could fund. Chris Cook there and Camilla batman joins me now. Before we start, Camilla, it is hard to stress enough. This is not about the extraordinary work you do for children, but it is about the way public money is spent and accounted for and seen to be spent. Uh, so help us work through some of the allegations that we've encountered tonight. And I want to start just by asking you to clarify your position. Have you stepped down as chief executive? No, I haven't yet. And I will do that when the children's staff and the trustees of the organization feel it's the right time and when we have appointed someone who can take over. It was always my intention to step down in the 20th year. But as things year. stand, you are still the chief executive. Absolutely, I am. And if the government withholds this three million pounds of funding, you will continue to remain in that position despite? I, I would have to then deal with the fact that the government is blackmailing a charity for no good reason. Uh, if we were engaged in any kind of malpractice, we had poor practice, why has government given us money repeatedly, most recently in April? Why suddenly this issue of me stepping down? What has changed from April till now? But it was understood that this morning you said you were going to step down, that that was understood to be the, the position that you were going to take imminently. Are you saying you could still be in this job I, in a year's time? I will, I know, I will step down when it's the right time for the children, the staff and the organisation and in discussion with our trustees. Because at the moment, there is no one to take up my role. So there's no succession plan? At the moment, there's no one. We have to, uh, we have to advertise. And that was our plan. It was always the plan with the trustees so that realistically, we would advertise for the, for, uh, so that someone could be appointed and I would help them settle in and I would m do an orderly handover in the 20th year. That's 2016. You could be in the job for months yet. Uh, well, I, I think that's realistic. And there's nothing wrong with me being in the job. I have run with my team an incredible organisation. There are 36,000 children, young people and vulnerable adults using it. There are five, uh, there's 650 staff, 500 clinical trainees, 100 external supervisors, a university okay. course. Uh, uh, it's a f very sophisticated organisation. Let's just deal. We've run it well. Let's just deal. I'm going to come back to those numbers in a second. Sure. The Department of Education has said their specific concern was a lack of accountability for money. This is a quote. However much she got, you could never tell what she spent it on and she always came back for more. This sense that when people were looking to work out where the money had actually gone, they couldn't make sense of it. Uh, that is entirely untrue. And I tell you why. Because they audit uh, our grant on a quarterly basis. So we can't get the next quarter unless we have passed the first quarter in reporting. At no time have any government departments criticised our reporting or not paid us our next instalment. These are new fabrications. Well, you know that when, when your company, when the charity nearly went bust, it was bailed out under the Labour government by Ed Balls, who said you need to put in a more robust business structure to help you through. It was unsustainable. Well, it's absolutely unsustainable because kids are self-referring off the street and because a child and young person is self-referring, no one will pay for it. And that's why we've been repeatedly in discussions with central government since the Blair government to try and resolve this issue. But and why would fact, you have ministers then like Michael Gove or Tim Lawton saying a better case can be made for putting the cash elsewhere? They, or, they're not denying it. They're just saying there are charities who have more transparency so people, the public, can actually see how the money's being spent. Well... Actually, the expenditure in our charity is very simple because it's 73% staff because we have to employ psychiatrists, social workers, psychiatric nurses. And what we spend on the children and young people in terms of housing, food and so on is really easy to audit. 
In fact, our financial accountability is very transparent and we've passed 19 years of independent audits without fault and most recently the cabinet office organized the financial audit in 2014 and again we passed well, that without trouble. You heard what your former staff member said there from the inside. It's relatively tenuous based on self-report. For example, the LSE report only talked to, what, a dozen children in that? It was all self-reported. No, the LSE spent actually six months with us, interviewed a range of staff and children. The ex-employee that you refer to who's just spoken was there seven years ago. And this is the only employee that you have identified to come in and do this report. The organization has some 650 other employees. We have a range of scientists with us and who've been doing research. Her criticisms are actually very invalid because it's incredibly difficult to measure complex work with very disturbed individuals and, that, and the measuring tools are not made. there. Of course, that's totally yeah. understandable and people will appreciate that. But to go back, for example, this figure of 36,000, which a couple of people have said to us has been inflated, that it includes carers or foster parents or school staff, that the real figure is more like 18,000 and these numbers become inflated to no, bring again, in more money. Again, that's not accurate and I tell you why. Because we work in a range of schools, so the numbers of children that we see in the schools are quite set. And then we have a set of numbers that pertain to the children who, and young people who access our street level centres. And then we have a set of numbers that are relevant to the vulnerable parents that we work with, because we have a lot of single mothers so with depression. So do you basically think that the, this is made staff, up and nothing has to change? The then? staff that we see uh, for therapeutic support in schools are no more than 90. And all this is properly accounted for. Otherwise, Emily, we would not have had the kind of government funding that we've been at the receiving end of. This is incredible double standard. On the one hand, government regularly gives us grants. On the other hand, they're criticizing our accountability. Well, which way round is it? If you had problems with our accountability and our management, what are you doing giving us public money? Let me just ask you, do you think you can raise the equivalent amount of money for this charity if you're not at the helm? Will you lose support? Uh, I actually think, and the reason I've continuously raised the alarm, is I think it's quite difficult to raise money uh, ad hoc in this way through fundraising when you're dealing with such a difficult caseload. And I think the conversation we need to be having and government is avoiding having is what is a small charity like Kids Company doing caring for psychotic children and young people, uh, for children and young people who have child protection issues. Yeah. And all this was evidenced through the Enough is Enough report of the Centre for Social Justice. This is not just my statements. Okay. And that's the conversation government should be having with us instead of discrediting the messenger. Kumala Batman-Gaj, thank you very much. Thanks thank for coming you. in.